Well, like several of you, for about over a week or so now, I've been having some sort of invasion of the upper respiratory system. I think it's about whip. Me and the antibiotics did a pretty good job on it. I can tell it's a little better because I hit my first tenor notes this afternoon, but it's still easier to sing bass. <laughs> I can tell I hit those tenor notes too. <laughs> We were talking this morning about something I think that we all too often don't think about, and that's the sovereignty of God. It's recorded in Brother C.R. Nichols' biography that he was going down the street one day, and he was very happy and whistling, and a lady met him and said, Why, you're so happy, so it's like you own the world. He quickly retorted, said simply, my father does. Now, I hope you get the implications of that regarding those of us in the family of God as his children. Everything is on our side, folks. And you say, well, this doesn't seem like it sometimes. Well, we've got to have a different view. Paul said, we walk by faith and not by sight. Too many of us still are anchored in an eyeball religion. That's all I know to call it. If I let just, and you let, anybody, just accepted what we perceive through the five senses that's going on in this world, first of all, many of us would never look in the mirror again. Because <laughs> things are going down, not up. But we look beyond that. Even the Bible tells us, though the outward man perishes, the inward man is renewed day by day. So think about that when it comes to serving God. If God is for us, who can be against us? So we have trust, faith, confidence, belief in God through the testimony of the Scriptures. Let's never lose, and I've emphasized this many times, let's never, never lose this and let's develop it more. When I say, speaking of anything moral or spiritual, that I believe this to be thus and so, then I ought to be able to say the Bible teaches thus and so. Why is that the case? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Many times today, people will use the word believe not in the sense of evidence producing faith and faith in God as the Word of God teaches things, but it's used in another way in our modern English. We mean, I think it's so. We would do better for our own well-being when we need to say, I think thus and so is this way, to use that rather than say, I believe it's so. Because sometimes we get to thinking, well, I believe it's so. That must be the way it is with God. No, the way it is with God is revealed in His Word. And when I have His Word for something, now I can say, I believe it. That's what it means when it says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And to walk by faith and not by sight is to walk on the basis of what's revealed in the Bible, not as things look to th uh, you through your five senses. I'm telling you, if you start trying to just base your hope of salvation, your confidence, in tr your trust as things are through the flesh, uh, there's not much there because it's changing all the time. The flesh is just so feeble and frail. And people do this, that, and the other. Uh, you don't know what they're going to do. And frankly, under given circumstances, <laughs> you don't know what you're going to do. But I, I do know what God's going to do. I even know what He expects of me. Now, whether I can live up to it is another story. But I know what He expects to, of me. I know where He stands with me. And I know where I stand with Him. And I can evaluate my life in the light of the rightly divided word and know things. And thus, I can know that God does hold all things in his hands. He controls it all. There's no reason for me to think because I've got cancer or I've got uh, this, that, and the other that's happened to me that's bad, that this has defeated God. How does any of those things affect God? None of them. I, I, I say this in a joking way, but to make a point... Uh, the way the election went last Tuesday didn't change a thing with God. Didn't change the gospel. Didn't change his plans for the world. Did not change one thing. Nothing. And yet sometimes I think we're sort of like, well, God was defeated last night. <laughs> no. 
You don't defeat God. It's an impossibility to defeat God. So I was talking about earlier several propositions that I set out, and I want to, uh, I want to continue with that because I think they're strengthening to us who serve God, who are His children. And they're in the Bible, so we won't be like other people. So we won't think like other people. And also it'll tell us when we are and when we need to change. I'd pointed out that because all authority to rule and to govern comes from God, those who are in authority are by the Holy Spirit called ministers, Romans 13, 4, servants. That's all, of course, ministers of God, servants of God. Romans 13, 6 and Jeremiah 25, 9. His shepherd, Isaiah 44, verse 28. His anointed, Isaiah 45 and verse 1. Now again, these words are descriptors. They're descriptive of their function and they say nothing about my supposed religious or spiritual or personal relationship to God. They're just talking about God working among men, many of those men who care nothing about God. But they're God's servants and ministers because they accomplish His will down through the stream of time as history has revealed or as it's been revealed about history. And it's not because they believe in Him. Let me emphasize that. It's not because they love Him. It's because God is in such a position being what God is that He can take the most rebellious person and in that person's rebellion use Him to do what He pleases. That's really the explanation with Pharaoh of old. In Revelation, or rather Acts, it's also mentioned, this same sentiment's mentioned in Revelation. Acts chapter 4, verses 27 and 28. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, the early church prayed, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Now when you read that, what do you think that he's wanting you to understand? There didn't anything happen to Jesus that God didn't have worked out. Remember Jesus said concerning his death on the cross and why he died on the cross, to this end was I born. Now to be able to make that statement, what does that say about what was in the mind of God being that he is omniscient, knowing all that is the object of knowledge before he ever came to this world? That ought to strengthen us to know that that's our Savior, that's God. In fact, God stirred up Nebuchadnezzar to launch an assault on Israel. Jeremiah tells them this, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, when they're still trying to figure out a way that they can whip the besieging Babylonian armies. Jeremiah 25, verses 8 and 9. And it was God who determined the outcome of the battle. Listen to this in uh, Daniel 1. Beginning of the book, Daniel 1, the first two verses, 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Daniel 1, 1 and 2. Now that's the way it begins. And then look at what you've got all the way through the book of God being involved in all these affairs. Notice further, the Lord gave. Ultimately, it was neither the uh, sin and weakness of Jehoiakim, nor the brilliance and the strength of Nebuchadnezzar, not even the impotence or inactivity of God, but the sovereign good pleasure of God Almighty that determine the historical outcome. And if you read Daniel 2, Daniel 2, verses 20 and 23, that becomes apparent. The Israelites are not mere pawns, as somebody said, pawns on a political and geographical chessboard. To be in the hand of Nebuchadnezzar is not to be out of the control of God. That's a marvelous statement. Because it comes right on down to all of us who serve God. To be under whatever 
political entity there is doesn't remove us from the control and care of God. And this is a great lesson that Paul urges upon us. Listen to him. And he, and he says it to a young preacher. Thus he needs to know it himself for his own personal benefit in the empire he worked in. But he needed to preach it to the church. And here's what Paul said. He urges, urges that supplications, prayer, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. Now watch now the specificity. For kings and all who are in high positions, to what end? That we, that's the church, Christians, may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. First Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Now you think of the people in government, whatever level it is, and you think of God saying, pray for those people for the good of the church. How do you pray for some of these people? Well, I can pray for the good of the church. After all, God ordained civil government. And when you look at how people have faithfully served God under all sorts of sizes of governments, and some of those governments are very terrible, then I know I can pray that they learn the truth. Have you ever prayed for our president that he would be exposed to the truth of the gospel, that his wife, and that his children have the opportunity to know the truth, that everyone in his cabinet, their wives, their children, and all who work would learn the truth of God's good word regarding salvation. Pray for every Supreme Court justice and every uh, representative in Congress, every senator, every federal judge, every governor. We ought to, to this end. You know, this is as plain as Acts 2, verse 38, is to a duty we have. And that's what we ought to be doing. So we're to pray to the Most High God. We should pray that their spirits, if you please, would be stirred up. That their hearts would be moved. That their thinking should be changed. That their character can be changed because their thinking is changed and thus incite them to enact legislation, all to accomplish what would be most beneficial to the church, the people of the living God. And when you study all you can find in the Old Testament and New, but especially specific incidents in the Old Testament of godly people under terrible kings and rulers, and they had direct dealing with these folks too, like Daniel, and yet they retained their integrity. They're held up by inspiration as men of great faith, and yet look sometimes what they had to do. We teach the little children Daniel in the lion's den. Well, that makes a nice story, but it wasn't just that for Daniel. <laughs> and then you think of uh, Hannah, Nye, Min Michelle, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You think of them thrown in that fiery furnace. And yet what God has revealed to us to show us that God was with them. Being known to the old king, we're not going to fall down and worship falsely. God can deliver us. We know that. But whether he does or whether he does not, we're not going to worship him. Those things aren't in the Bible just take up space. They're here for you. Read the writer of Hebrews. He says these things can't be complete without us. They were written for our learning. Although we are ultimately citizens of a heavenly kingdom and therefore only secondarily citizens of an earthly state, it is for that reason we are not to exempt, we're not exempt from submitting to the laws of the land where we live. Peter deals with that in 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17. So our responsibility, let me emphasize this, our responsibility to honor and submit to the government, and that's what Peter says in those verses, the government of the country wherein we have our citizenship or wherever we are, is not dependent on whether or not we voted for its leaders or whether we like them or don't like them. It's dependent upon things we've already studied concerning the fact that God set that government in order. And doesn't mean that he says everybody there is just like he wants them to be. But it does mean that he's in control. Let me explain further if I can along this line. Peter knew what it was. Just think of Peter's life. He knew exactly what it was firsthand. 
to live under tyranny, to live under barbarism. He was born under the rule of Emperor Augustus. But the more direct authority over his life in those days there in Galilee would have been early on Herod the Great. You know, he's a nice fellow to order all the slaughter of the male infants in and around Bethlehem. And he also didn't mind killing his own family if they threatened him. He was doing that, of course, in Bethlehem to try to kill Jesus. Peter was also or would also have experienced the rule of uh, Herod Antipas. He's the one who executed John the Immerser. And uh, not only he, did he preside over the mock trial of Jesus, but when you read all of it, you see that he joined with the soldiers under his authority to torment and ridicule the Lord. Peter would have known Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea, who definitely had the power to let him go. He's too big a chicken to do it. It was a political matter, so... Uh, he saves his own conscience, what conscience he had left, and washed his hands and called him a just person. You go ahead and deal with him like you want to, but I'm not. Pious fraud is what he was. He had him beaten and then delivered him over to be crucified. Peter was especially acquainted with Herod Agrippa. It was Herod Agrippa who executed James, brother of John, and arrested Peter with full intent to do the same thing to him. And then, of course, Peter lived, as far as we know, under the tyrannical rule of Nero. Why go through all this? Well, my point is simply to argue that Peter was not naive about the potential for corruption and evil in those who held governmental and political power, yet he still wrote the passage we mentioned. And the obligation we have to be in uh, submission to government. Uh, by the way, he never lived in a, quote, Christian nation, unquote. Truth of the matter is, we haven't either. He knew all too well about the depravity of these men who wielded authority in Rome and more closely to his home in Palestine. And yet he tells every one of us, told the people of his day, without any hesitation as he wrote part of the New Testament of the Christ be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution and then he says whether it's emperors or kings and he says honor them now think of the people that he's talking about not our day and time the people I just mentioned that some of them he dealt with almost directly it's important to hear what Peter says in this text because his description of Christians is that we're pilgrims, we're strangers, we're sojourners, we're, we're exiles on this earth. 1 Peter 1, 1 and chapter 2, verse 11. And that might lead some people to think that, well, if we're that way as far as our relationship to this world, then uh, we're exempt from earthly rules and laws and obligations to human authority and civil law. Well, that's just not the case. They might reason like, well, after all, I, I'm a citizen of the heavenly kingdom under King Jesus. Why should I bother obeying the dictates of an earthly system, especially like we just described that Peter was under? Well, if this world is not my ultimate home, somebody might say, being as I'm an alien in exile in this world, a pilgrim and a sojourner and a stranger, that I shouldn't have to care about following the standards and rules that govern those who know nothing of God or His kingdom. Right? Wrong. As wrong as it can be. It is, of course, true that Christians are not, number one, first citizens of any earthly nation. We are, number one, citizens of the kingdom of God. We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2 or 3 and verse 20, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christians are aliens. Christians are pilgrims. Christians are strangers and exiles. We're sojourners in, in America since we're in this part of the world. That doesn't mean we're free to live in anarchy 
are in defiance of the civil government that God has placed over us. Peter may also have been anticipating the possibility that some might call for our complete withdrawal from the world, from society. You'll remember that on numerous occasions, if you study anything about church history, there have been in the great departure from the faith over the years at different times, even this present day, efforts to completely withdraw from the world so they can get away from the world. Of course, they don't realize being human beings, they carry the world with them. Uh, various kinds of so-called Christian communities have formed to attempt to create, I like to call it their own spiritual ghetto. <laughs> And uh, various kinds of enclaves, and we heard more about it as some kind of commune in which they swear allegiance only to themselves and refuse to acknowledge the authority of the state in any respect. Now, if you can know anything about what we've read from the scriptures, then you know that uh, Peter's saying that is not in the design scheme, design of things, the scheme of things, that God wants Christians to be that way. We must acknowledge the civil government went under. There's yet another reason Peter says what he does in this passage, and it's found in verse 15. Just as our conduct in general can be used of God, of course, in preaching the gospel to bring people to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, so also our law-abiding Obedience to the civil governing authorities can silence the unwarranted accusations of those who oppose us. And uh, I think an interesting thing came up. Lipscomb did not hold the view. David Lipscomb of 19th century, dying early in the 20th century, who helped start the gospel advocate. and was an extremely influential powerhouse in the church in the last 50, 60 years of uh, let's say from 1865 up to 1910 somewhere along in there Lipscomb had a false view of civil government he thought it was wicked and Christians just leave it all alone but he didn't oppose it he just thought you ought to be a part of it but now he lived through a little time called the American Civil War nothing was disrupted at that time uh, but Nashville Tennessee was occupied most of the time why would I call it occupied? Well, blue coats were there. It seesawed back and forth to a great extent. But he was there preaching all that time. He had suspended operations of the very new gospel advocate at that time because of all the problems that went along with producing such during such an upheaval. Well, you've got to remember that in Southern history, a great amount of the preaching of rebellion in the United States was done for pulpits throughout the South. And so what the Federals did when they were in Nashville, they had officers sent out to the various churches to listen to the preachers to see what they were preaching. And thus, Lipscomb had one of those fellows come and listen to him. The report the man gave when he got back is, he said, I don't know what in the world he believes about civil government or the Confederacy or anything to do with uh, the Union but he sure does believe in Christ and the gospel. Well, that tells you something about how you approach certain things, how you get things done, because I don't think in my study of his life and other people's study of his life, there was never a person any more obedient to whatever civil law was governing him at that time. And that did pose a special problem then, because what are you under, the Confederacy or are you under the Union? The state you're in has withdrawn legally, <laughs> from whose perspective? From the Union by a vote. So what do you do? Well, his view was, well, the Confederates are in town. I do what they tell me. <laughs> when the Yankees are in town, I do what they tell me because they're the civil authority at that time. So there can be special problems arising, and nobody's advocating obey the law of the land if it goes directly against God. But I'm going to tell you, we better sit down and, and, and do some serious study of the Bible to know the difference in our rights and what the Bible says is essential before we violate God's will. As far as I know, Christianity has existed a long time and may exist a whole lot longer if the world goes on before there ever was a Bill of Rights and a Constitution. <laughs> and it's nothing to say that if this people of this land wants to remove that Constitution, 
in the way that the Constitution can be amended, get enough of them, they can do it. Now, what are we going to do? We're going to be Christians, and we're not going to violate any law that is going to cause us to sin against God. It's that simple. We're not going to violate any, any kind of law that's going to cause us to sin against God. We're going to be obedient to every law, even if it's distasteful, folks. Even if it may take away some of our rights because somebody's changed the Constitution. You know, if I were in Israel, I may not like it because the authorities may have me close my business on the Sabbath day. And I may want to demonstrate in the streets like people think they want to do for my rights as a Christian in Israel to operate my business on the Sabbath day. As far as I know, none of that has a thing to do with whether I serve God or I don't. There's got to be some thinking done by people as to what really constitutes such things as that. And I don't know whether we've got our minds anywhere near that yet to think through it. Because I'm afraid a lot of us think <laughs> there wouldn't be a church without the United States. <laughs> well, I think it's flourished here. I'm all for it. As a part of the government, I will certainly uh, do what I can that's right to uphold what we've had. But I've got to know what is sin and what is not. Because I can't sin. That is, in the sense that I'm engaged in something that's sin. But I've got to know the difference. Every right that the Constitution guarantees me, I'm glad for every one of them. But I can be a Christian without a one of them. And people have been most of this whole world's existence since the church started. Do I want to lose those things? I do not. Do I, in the framework in which we operate, feel like I have authority from God to speak out and try to keep them? I certainly do. But if the government changes them, the legitimate means, now are we going to accept it? Or are we going to say, no, I'm not? Now when you say, no, you're not, then you're going to be able to bring a direct statement, an implication, or an example from the New Testament to show your authority with Jesus Christ to where you won't obey the law. Got to think about things like that, because I can tell you right now, we're under stricter laws now than some of our forefathers ever were. Some of them back in the early part of the, <laughs> the early part of the 19th century wouldn't know how to live under the type of laws we live under now. So you got to think about that. What seems so strange on the surface is not so strange when you really sit down to have one view and one view alone. I'm going to do what God said, no matter what. It's, of course, as I say, true that our citizenship is in heaven and from it we wait for a Savior. And we are out aliens and so forth. I know all of that. But I also know what the Bible says about our obligation to be obey obedient to civil law. You cannot, you just cannot be faithful to God and ignore those teachings of the Bible regarding our obligation to civil law. You can't do it. And you've got to know which laws cause you to sin against God if you keep them. And which laws don't. You just don't like them. You just can't. you, you got to think that way. I can say one thing. The times they are changing. We don't want to change anything when it comes down to the truth of God's word. Well, let's be sure when we stand for anything or oppose anything, we have the full authority of Jesus Christ behind us. So our obedience to the governing authorities is at best only secondary. Our primary allegiance is to God. It's because our primary allegiance is to God that we even take the view we do about civil law. Because that's found in Romans 13. And it's because I love the Lord, I keep his commandments. And that's one of his commandments. To understand civil law, civil government, what it's supposed to be. We obey them because we obey him. Peter also implies this, that our ultimate aim in obedience to the law of the land is the glory of God. Notice he says in these passages, it's for his sake to bring honor to him and to make known his greatness and his majesty that we give our lives in obedience to the emperor or king or president or whoever is in power. Now, Peter's not saying that. I'd like to know what, what he's saying. We do not simply obey in order to preserve our reputation but to enhance and promote our Lord's reputation by setting a good example as law-abiding citizens. 
The biblical approach to our civic duties is again set out then in verse 15. We live in obedience to the law because it is the will of God. Not laws you think you ought to obey and laws you like to obey, but all of them. He says that in so doing, we put to silence those who persist in accusing us and slandering us by saying that we are contrary to the law. 1 Peter 2 and verse 12. Again, going to verse 16, we are to live in this world not primarily as subjects of an earthly president or whoever in civil government, but as servants of God. Now here's another point. Although we are submissive to the authority of government, Christians have a responsibility as citizens of both heaven and earth to influence for good all they are around and with whom they are involved. And that takes in the government under which we live. Let me mention only a couple of examples where Christians publicly uh, criticized government and its leaders and sought to exert a positive influence on governmental officials and held them accountable to biblical values of morality. And you already know them, but I don't know where you're thinking of them in this context. In Daniel chapter 4 and verse 27, listen, this is Daniel speaking. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. And break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Now what's Daniel doing there? He's saying if you want the best for your kingdom, you better listen to God and live like he tells you. Let me ask you something. Because some of us have written emails and we've sent notes and whatever else to this one, that, and the other one, senators and congressmen, about the state of affairs. How many of you have ever sat down and just written a letter to the President of the United States, just like you'd write it to somebody you know personally that's not in harmony with God's will and you want them to change their ways? You know what we think? Why, well, he'll never see it. Some underling will get it and do whatever. Hey, listen, if he never sees it on the day of judgment, you did your part to try to get him to see it. Don't we reason that way on door knocking? We go out here once a month, we knock on doors, most every one of them turns us down. Or worse than that, sometimes. <laughs> Not too often, but they reject us. What's that person going to say on the day of judgment? He says, well, I didn't know. Well, yes, somebody came to your house. Somebody came to your house and offered you the opportunity to learn the truth. Offered you a literature. You weren't interested. It's amazing what we might do if everybody, just a member of the Church of Christ, were to really write a letter that, just like you're writing it to your best friend who's apostatized or your best friend or member of the family you want to convert and say, I'll just write a letter. Don't write one that would go from here to next week lengthy-wise. Well, just write it. Put a track in it. Send it. You don't know what will happen. Part of our problem in this is that we think, well, they're not interested in that. Rather than look at the people that are set out in the book of Acts that were converted. Do you really think today most members of the church would think you could reap the treasure of the United States? But God had Philip leave a very prosperous and good gospel meeting in Samaria to go down here in the desert and meet up with, of all people, the treasure of the queen of Ethiopia. And lo and behold, he was studying the Bible when he found him. And he preached the gospel to him, he obeyed the gospel. Does that tell us anything? Don't sit in judgment on who or who may not be interested in the truth. Listen to this. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. Luke 3, 18 through 20. Now, why does that say what John was doing? He was letting a hammer down when it came to the kind of life Herod was living. He didn't back up from him. Yeah, but I want my head cut off. Well, better our heads wind up where his did than where we're going to be if we don't. Then listen to this in Acts 24, 24 and 25, the light of what this sermon's all about. And after certain days when Felix came with his wife, Priscilla, you ought to read about some of these characters. I mean, I don't know why in the world Hollywood hadn't picked up on them. They didn't do anything else they've ever had thought of in their ungodliness. 
which was a Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, we've got sermons that Paul uh, preached. We've got writings that he wrote. What do you think he preached to those people that he didn't write down that we can read about? And as he reasoned, uh, now he's preaching to an official, a king. As he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have convenient season, I'll call for thee. What does it tell us about the early church getting right before people in government and laying it out just like it was? When Paul says that God ordained human government, invest it with authority, he does not mean to suggest that government is therefore free to do as it pleases. It is subject to God and His will. Government is not morally autonomous. And if the Lord's church doesn't see the need to stand up like John and Paul and let the hammer down to tell people what God thinks about it, who on this earth is really going to do it fully? Nobody. Into our hands the gospel is given, even preaching to the President of the United States and every senator, whoever it might be, locally or whatever. On what issues ought we to seek to exert our influence? Certainly it would include such matters as sexual morality, Dignity of life, that is, dealing with uh, abortion. Education. Even the environment. You know, we haven't done a lot of study on what God says we should do about this world. And yet we're taught in the very beginning of the book, it's been given under our dominion. Therefore, we have a responsibility the way things go on in this world. And I'd certainly rather have Christians <laughs> trying to deal with that and these pot-smoking characters trying to tell me how things ought to be green. Poverty and... Homelessness, war, national defense, the principles of right and wrong. All these things are things the church can preach on and individuals can let the government know that God put them in that position. And they need, like Daniel said in Nebuchadnezzar, if you want to have a good situation, you better listen to God. And he said, well, they won't listen to us. So what? I preached all my life. A lot of folks haven't listened to me. And they sit right in front of me. Why, should, why does that make any difference who won't listen to you? Think about that for a minute. If we, if we take the position, well, I, they won't listen to me. Why do we try anything? Why do we, why do we say anything? Uh, my, how they need to listen to us on the matter of, even the Bible has principles that bear upon the economy and marriage and family. Not just to mention a few. All of it's in the will of God. It's in the book divine. God's legislated on it. We read in Romans 13 elsewhere that the primary purpose of the state, and, and this has been missed, is to preserve and protect public morality, justice, and to ensure the punishment of the offender. Now, don't we have something to say on that? We ought to be having something to say on it. Uh, or we're not really what we ought to be as Christians. It's not the purpose of the state to promote the gospel but to provide a legal and moral atmosphere in which the church can do its work. 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2. And that's the reason sometimes we vote for one candidate over another, even though that one we vote for is by no means a Christian. It's because of the morality they uphold. Thus, when uh, you vote, you should ask the question, which candidates or which political party is most effective in promoting moral righteousness and praising good when it appears and who is most committed to punishing and prohibiting evil. Then another, which candidates or which political party is most sincerely committed to the advancement of biblical values? How in the world should we have to even ask those questions of people who are Christians? That ought to be just natural as the blood coursing through our veins is necessary for this body to live. It should be that natural in the, in the members of the body of Christ. If someone says that in doing this we are legislating our morality, our response should be, well, of course we are. Why do we back down from that? My, my, the law of Moses was encoded, set down, and it was legislated. What is wrong with legislating morality? Tell me that. Because they don't mind legislating immorality right and left. But I don't hear any of these folks saying, well, I think you shouldn't be legislating immorality. Well, if it's wrong to legislate morality, it's wrong to legislate immorality. It's all law. It's all law. Here's what we're getting at. All, 
All laws in this area are moral statements. <laughs> it's right, you know, we're all for abortion. If that's not a moral statement, I'd like to know what it is. Every law that forbids some action or requires another is declaring that something is either wrong or right. That it's either beneficial or destructive to society. Now who better than faithful members of the church should comment on that? Another point. Although Christians are responsible to exert a positive influence on government, nowhere in the New Testament do we see that elders of the church or deacons of the church or preachers, by virtue of the fact that they're simply elders or deacons or preachers, have authority in or responsibility over local, state, or national government decision making. Whatever you do in that area, you do as an individual, not as the church. There is no Church of Christ political party. <laughs> There's no such thing. It's not the New Testament. It's formed the New Testament. You have no authority to form such a thing. You do have authority to act as an individual according to the Christian you are by the authority of God. And we've already seen each one of us has an important place to occupy in influencing this government. But you don't do it as the church per se. We're not going to have a convention here at this building to choose who our next person we're going to run for president or senator is. Not at all. No government or earthly authority or political party platform ever sent anyone to hell. You know, politics doesn't have that power. We are do well to remember that. It just doesn't. It's the Lord God Almighty and His authority expressed in the Word of God that sets out the way to heaven and shows you what's going to happen if you don't abide by it because that's going to send you straight to torment. It's unrepentant pride and immorality and rebellion and unbelief that sends people to hell. And who better than the church than to point that out to governments or anything else? No government or earthly authority or political platform can save a single human soul. On the other hand, Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone through the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only one that can. The church has that responsibility to preach Christ and crucified and uphold every moral principle the Bible sets out and to point out that because the government is ordained of God, then the people in government will do far better to follow the truth of God's word in forming their moral views and whatever than uh, any other thing. Now you say, well, I sure do. You never get those people to do that. <laughs> How do you know? How do you know? Wouldn't it be wonderful if some of these folks in government would really debate some of us on these very principles? You just don't know. <laughs> Daddy, you say, you don't know if you tried. All I can do is tell you no. We have a small view of ourselves, and in some ways we're sort of like the ten spies that came back well, there were giants in the land, and we were as grasshoppers in their sight. Why do we feel that way about ourselves? Certainly not taught in the Bible. Jesus declared all power or authority hath been given unto me in heaven and earth. Hey, you know he means it? <laughs> he means that. Everybody in government is going to have to bow the knee to Jesus Christ because all authority in civil government came from God. The very idea of civil government came from God. And the church is the one to teach the truth. But yet again, don't lose sight of what we said throughout this sermon regarding how governments can be so wicked and yet where in their laws don't violate God's will. Romans 13 says you obey them. Who's president, whoever is president, queen or whatever, <clears throat> that person is a small Q queen or a small K king is Jesus that is the capital K king. Regardless of who is in whatever part of civil government, <clears throat> Jesus is still king of kings and lord of lords. Revelation 19, 16, 17, 14. No matter who's president, Jesus is still seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. Regardless of who is president, Jesus will not have failed. 
God was not voted out of heaven the other night, and no man can do that. And even whoever is put wherever in civil government, it doesn't touch God, top side, bottom, or edge. And the Bible's clear on our responsibility to civil government. Political events are always and ever in his hands, no matter the results. And I'll have you take that with you if you don't take anything else. God has not lost control. Let us not begin to judge God on the basis of our finite human existence for a little while that appears as a vapor and is then gone. God judges the whole thing from end to uh, from the beginning to the end and everything in between. And what he does and who he allows where all fits the divine scheme of things. And if it took some 4,000 years to get from Genesis down to the statement in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Then who are we to say, well, I don't know why this is happening now. I just, no, God has... All of his plans. He carries out his plans. He wastes no energy. There's no unnecessary anything. It all fits. And in the fullness of time, just when God knows, and he's the only one who can, thus and so ought to take place, then it will. So I ask you quickly as we close the lesson to think back over the 20th century. Why was there a World War I? Why was there the communist overthrow of a czar who himself wasn't worth much in Russia? And why was it allowed to go on for 70 years? Why in the midst of all of that was there, were there the fastest governments and all that had to happen in World War II? Why was there the Korean War, the Vietnam War, all these, why all these different people? Does that mean God doesn't control any of it? Well, we're here just for a while, and we're gone. But God's here always. He started it, and he'll end it. And he knows how to arrange everything in between. And there's no reason for any of us to feel all beside ourselves and that everything is lost because some nut is not a place of government. Listen, there's been a history of nuts, far worse than what we've ever known, with absolute power over a kingdom. And you know... God didn't quake one time when they were there. I, I end where we started. And that is that God sets them up and he puts them down. But they don't do anything except that it ultimately and finally fits in his divine scheme of things. And if you're a Christian, you're his child and special, and there's no reason to worry about all this stuff. Commit it to prayer, study the Bible, understand the design of civil law, live your life faithfully, and we can sing that song honestly. God will take care of you. That doesn't remove from us responsibility to do what we can. I'm not saying that. But I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow any more than you do. But I know if tomorrow comes, who's going to control it ultimately and finally. And someday, everybody will be all stewing around about the stock market and about civil government, and God will say, bow the horn. We're going to close the stock market and everything else. And then what will your treasure be? That's the key. Let's lay up our treasure in heaven. Trust God taking care of us by seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. And he will supply all the rest. Do you believe him? He said he would. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Take him at his word. Live a peaceable life. And then go home to be with him forever. And leave the nuts back in the fire. If you're subject to the invitation of Christ to be a Christian or to be restored, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.